Well, enough about that. Let's get into the Word of God. And I'm excited about the Word of God this morning. We have been talking about God. We, we talked about who God is and hopefully gave you uh, some good information on who God is. We also uh, told you who Jesus is, and I hope you were blessed by those messages. We think we know God, we think we know Jesus, but it's, it's always good to get down to Scripture so that we know what the Bible has to say about who God is, who Jesus is, and today we're talking about the third person in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Now, it's been my experience in the past that anytime you speak about the Holy Spirit, just something happens in the atmosphere. There's just something that happens. There's just something uh, that, that I, I don't even know how to explain it. But, but today we're talking about the third person in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Now, when I was in my 20s, kind of mid-20s, uh, started getting a little more interested in the news, right? And at about that time, the news started coming on more often, more the 24-7 news was coming on. And... I got really interested in the news, what's going on in our world. I'll tell you what, I found some news anchors and some reporters even uh, that would often talk about Christianity and even profess Christianity. And they had a Christian perspective in what they shared. But what I noticed was really interesting is that something didn't feel full Christian. Like they had most of the details right. But then you kept on listening, and for some reason, their life just wasn't evident that there was a whole lot of Christianity in there. Like, like they said the right things, uh, and they communicated the right morals and the right values, values that certainly aligned with my values. But as I continued to hear them, I would say there's, there's something missing there. Like, I, I can't pinpoint it. I would submit today to you that what was missing was probably the work of the Holy Spirit in that person's life. And you're thinking, well, yeah, but when you're saved, Pastor Rob, isn't it true that the Holy Spirit comes and takes residence inside of you? That is true. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But for now, just, just uh, stay with me for a moment. Because I know that you have seen Christians in your lifetime that professed Christianity, their morality was right, what they verbalized, what they communicated was things that you align with, that, that seem to align with Scripture mostly, but, but there was just something missing, and you just couldn't put your finger on it. Anybody ever had that experience with anyone? You just didn't know what it was. You just didn't know. And, and I would submit to you, it's possibly the Holy Spirit that was missing. And, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. You see, the Holy Spirit, the Bible communicates that the Holy Spirit is to us a helper. As a Christian, you really don't start seeing evidence of a Christian life and a Christian walk until you start yielding to the Holy Spirit in your life. That's just the reality. You could be a Christian by name, by title, but until you start yielding to the Holy Spirit in your life, you really don't start seeing evidence of anything. I'm going to share with you a, a story here with you. Uh, I, back in 2019, I decided that I needed to set a few pounds, that I needed to get in a little more shape, and then I decided to join a gym. I joined our retro fitness gym right here in South Plainfield and decided I'm going to go, and I'm going to go pretty faithfully, and I did. I was going about three, four times a week going faithfully to the gym, but I was seeing very little results. The reason is because, to be quite honest with you, while I appreciate gyms and think that they serve some value to our lives, and I, I think we should go to the gym, I, I believe that, the reality, if I'm honest, I don't like going to the gym. I don't know if anybody ever felt that, but me, I don't like it, especially since I am an, I'm an early bird, and, and I like going to the gym early in the morning. I'm talking 5.30 in the morning. I like to already be on that treadmill doing my thing. So I decided I'm going to go, and I was going faithfully, but I was seeing few results. And I believe that the reason I was seeing few results is because I really wasn't so interested in working out. 
I really was just interested in saying that I was working out, right? I just wanted to tell people that I went to the gym, right? And I was seeing nothing because there was very little investment. Like, you can't go to the gym for half an hour, you know, and, and do the treadmill at a very slow speed snail space uh, and and expect that you're going to shed pounds. It just doesn't happen like that. You're going to see very little results. But I had a friend. And when I told my friend that I've been going to the gym, he kind of, I could see the puzzled face, right? Like, like you really, you're sure you've been going to the gym? And, and uh, he, on the other hand, was someone that did work out and, and really had a, a nice physique, you know? And, and he told me, when, when do you go to the gym? I said, well, I go in the mornings, about 5.30, I'm there. He goes, yeah, that's when I like to go to the gym too. He goes, how about we go together and I'll, I'll help train you? And I said, uh, yeah, sure, why not? So he came, and, and we both, we met up at the gym, and we went, and, uh, and after I was done at the treadmill, okay, uh, I'm ready to go now, and he's like, oh, no, 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 that was just the warm-up. And I'm like, what? He goes, that's just the warm-up. Let's get, and he introduced me to these things called weights. I don't know if you've ever heard of these things, but they're heavy. He introduced me to these weights, and, and he said, oh, we're going to do this, and I got to tell you. After my first time with him, I could barely drive my car going back home because I was just so sore. But they tell me that's a good thing. So I went with him, and I started going with him, and I started doing the weights. And slowly but surely, I was gaining more strength. I was starting to lift a little heavier. And, and I started seeing some results, right? Uh, and and it, it started to feel good. And now, you know, 2020 happened, you know, and COVID chubby happened as long, along with it. And, and I'm just like, Lord, you know, I need to get back there. I need to get back with my buddy or a buddy, somebody to take me to the gym again. And uh, don't get me wrong, I do have a treadmill at home, and I, I do do it faithfully. This week was a little bit of a not so much, but I've been trying, and I've been trying to just get right back in the rhythm and, and doing things again. Nevertheless, I really started to see results when I had a trainer, when I had a helper, when I had someone that was there with me to show me what I needed to do. Because me, on my own, I did not know what I needed to do. And the, the reality is, if you've never been to a gym and you go to a gym for the first time, it's intimidating. Because everybody there looks like they know what they're doing. Don't get me wrong, they're very nice people. And if you ask questions, people will answer. But they don't look it. <laughs> like they look like this and they look like, don't bother me right now. But they're not. They're very nice people. Uh, so go to the gym. That's the moral of that story. But again, I needed a helper. Jesus, when he was leaving us, he said to us, he said to the disciples, I'm leaving, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you alone, but rather I'm going to uh, send you a helper. In fact, this is exactly it. I I'm going to send you a helper. Now, there's something that, a couple things that we need to know about who this helper is and what this helper does. Now, some have said, uh, Jehovah Witnesses in particular, and I'm not saying this to uh, belittle them or, 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 or anything like that. Uh, I believe that Jehovah Witnesses are people that uh, may love God and may genuinely be seeking God. But when it comes to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, uh, they're not... Uh, Bible-based. In fact, when it comes to several pieces of doctrine, uh, Jesus, for, for example, the Trinity, these are things that they see differently. Uh, and, and I got to tell you, it's not based on Scripture. It's, uh, it's based on a perversion of their own Bible. But one of the things that they'll tell you about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is a force. The Holy Spirit, in their opinion, is an energy it's not a person, it's not God, uh, but the problem with that is that that's not what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit. When you read the Bible, you come to this realization that first and foremost, the Holy Spirit is indeed God. And today I want to talk to you about how that happens. He is God. We're going to talk about how the Holy Spirit is, is God. And again, we have to go to this concept of the Trinity. The Trinity, where is God? God being one, one being, three persons, one being, three persons, 
Think about your crazy aunt. Maybe that's close to the Trinity. But, but one being, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, it is a complicated uh, understanding of the Word of God. Like, like, you really, it's hard to wrap our heads around that because when we think about ourselves, it's one person, one being, one being, one person. God is not like us. And, and I want you to know that's important to know. Jehovah Witnesses will tell you, well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. Therefore, there is no Trinity. And the reality is, is that to pigeonhole it to, to just a single word that's not in the Bible, they're right. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. It's a theological uh, word that we use to describe the triune God. But God certainly presents himself in a triune way. You read about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here's what you need to know about the Holy Spirit in particular. The Holy Spirit first and foremost, possesses the attributes of God. Possesses the attributes of God. Now, I don't have time to go over every attribute and everywhere that the Bible uh, talks about it, but here are just a few. Number one, the Holy Spirit is present everywhere. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. And if you'd like, I can share scripture with you after the service, but the Holy Spirit is present everywhere, just like God is present everywhere. The Holy Spirit knows all things just like God knows all things. The Holy Spirit has infinite power just like God has infinite power. The Holy Spirit, just like God, is eternal. Just like God, the Holy Spirit has never had a beginning and will never have an end. The Holy Spirit, according to the Word of God, is eternal. You can read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. You could also see John verse four, uh, chapter 14, verse 16. The Holy Spirit is eternal. The Holy Spirit is unique. The Holy Spirit is like no other. The Holy Spirit is holy. And just to what our sister Dameli spoke about just a little earlier, the Holy Spirit is the seal of ownership marking every believer. You know, she talked a little earlier about how when you have something, something that you love, you take care of that thing. Like something that you really love and appreciate, you take care of that thing. When people touch that thing, you, you have a fit over people touching that your thing. The same way you belong to God. Not only did God the Father give God the Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us, but he also placed his Holy Spirit inside of every one of us as a seal, as a deposit. Uh, when I purchased the engagement ring for my wife, the first thing I had to do was leave a deposit. And I left that deposit, and that deposit was there to show the store owner that I was serious. It was enough money to show this kid is not going to want to lose that much money. So he's coming back. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit is for us. In the believer, when you come to Christ, when you come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you, and that's the seal. That's the seal of your salvation. Not only that, but the Holy Spirit also performs divine works performs divine works what does he do well he creates and he gives life just like God creates and God gives life so the Holy Spirit possesses all the same attributes as God in the Bible in the Bible you see the Holy Spirit just have this equation that he just equals God not only that, the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the term Holy Spirit is used interchangeably with the term God. So uh, sometimes the Bible will say God, sometimes it'll say Holy Spirit, and it's all talking about the same thing. We'll take Acts chapter 5, for example. And I, I just un I covered some of the text here because that's stuff that is important, but for our purposes right now, we just want to kind of skip over it for now. Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. This is what the Bible says. But Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan so filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Let me just explain who Ananias and his wife Sapphira were. 
for a moment, these were people that were giving to the church. Uh, what was happening was is that people will, were selling their possessions and they were bringing it before the apostles' feet so that the apostles can distribute it amongst the poor in the early church. This is amazing. In the early church, there was no one. The Bible says there was no one in need because the believers were sharing their resources. Now, this was not socialism. This was not imposed on the church. This was not something that was mandated. This was something that was happening happening naturally. People were giving of themselves and giving of their possessions on their own. So Ananias and Sapphira noticed that people really, I mean, the people that gave, that they were getting some type of recognition. Today they were saying, hey, Bob gave, and oh, well, thank you, Lord, for Bob. And Susie gave, oh, thank you for Susie. And Petralka gave, thank you for Petralka, Lord. And, and so Ananias and Sapphira wanted to get on that action. They wanted to get in on that. And they decided to sell their property, and they had committed the entire sale to the Lord. But what happened, and, and I know this has happened maybe in your life before, when they came ready to give it all, they were tempted. They were tempted, maybe not all, because we did get a lot of money for this property. Maybe we'll give a portion, a good portion, but not all. So they brought a portion, but they had already committed to God that they would give it all. And they said, this is it. This is all of it. So they come, and the Lord, the Holy Spirit actually had already spoken to Peter and said, hey, when Ananias and Sapphira come around, just know that this is the down low. This is, this is the, the scoop on their offering. Could you imagine that? Like you brought your offering to church, and the pastor said, hey, 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 was that all of it? Was that the full tithe? And, and, and you're looking like, um, uh, I think so. Like I'm pretty sure this is what was going on. In the New Testament. So for all of those that want to get back to New Testament times, all right, let's go, let's get right back there. But Peter already knew what had happened. And Peter goes, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Later on, he says, you have not lied to man, but to God. Again, the Holy Spirit is being equated to God. The terms are being interchangeable. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Do you not know that you are God's temple? Again, we see this interchange between God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you. So you have the spirit of God and God's temple, uh, God the Father here and God the Spirit being used, that term being used interchangeably. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is the spirit. The Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Again, you get this sense that the Lord, God, the spirit are one in the same they're not different. And believe me, I can keep on going here and go further than that. But, but I, I need to get through this. The Spirit, next thing you should know is that the Spirit is identified with the Father and the Son. The Spirit is identified with the Father and the Son. Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission. We'll read this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name, not the names, but rather the name, one name, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Again, there's one name, one triune God, and, and, and they are combined together. The Spirit is being identified alongside of the Father and the Son. Now watch this for a minute. Watch this for a minute. The Father would be a person, right? Person. The Son would be a person. Person, right? Now the Holy Spirit. Imagine if this was really meant to talk about a force, Imagine if this was really to be talked about as an energy, if the Holy Spirit was an energy. Imagine that. It would be a totally different, it wouldn't even make sense. Gravity, for example, is an energy. 
Gravity is a force, and you would never say, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of an energy or of a force. The Holy Spirit here is God. It's being uh, interchanged with the Father or is being identified along with the Father and the Son. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So even in a benediction, all three are being used together. And in Ephesians 2, 18, for through him we have both access in one spirit to the Father. I highlighted him because there in that passage it's referring to Jesus. Jesus is the him. And we see the Spirit and the Father all in one. Enough to say, or suffice to say, the Holy Spirit is God. Is God. And if you want to study this further, be happy to do that with you. But not only is uh, the Holy Spirit God, the Holy Spirit is also a person. And by the way, I know I didn't warn you at the beginning, but this is a very long introduction to my short sermon. I preach short sermons. You know that. I wouldn't mess you up with a long sermon. I think that's irresponsible of preachers to do. I preach short sermons. My introductions, though, you have to hang in tight for. So first, and here's the thing. You have to know what we're talking about before I can tell you what we're talking about. So first, the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is a person, not a force. How do we know this? A couple of ways we know this. Number one, the Holy Spirit is in relationship with persons. We already spoke about the fact that he's with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in Matthew 28. So we know that he's in relationship with persons. He's in relationship with the Trinity. He's also in relationship with us. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with what? With you all. He is a person. Acts 15, 28. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden. There was an issue there where... The, the idea of circumcision. They were saying, okay, we have all these Gentiles and they're getting saved. Do we circumcise them as well? And the apostles got together, they met, and they said, well, it, it seemed right to us and it seemed right to the Holy Spirit. And then they sent the message as to what that message was that they had with the Holy Spirit. Again, the idea there, I don't want it to get lost, is the fact that you have the Holy Spirit, a person, interacting with other people. The Holy Spirit can be treated in personal ways. The Holy Spirit can be treated in personal ways. The only people, or the only, if you want to call it things, the only things that you can treat in personal ways are persons. Anybody here watch the movie Cast Away? All right, you've seen the movie Cast Away. Now, I don't remember uh, the role of Tom Hanks, but I know you know who Tom Hanks is. And in your mind, you probably don't even know or remember the name that Tom Hanks played. So I'm just going to call him Tom Hanks. Is that okay? Tom Hanks, in this movie, he is left alone in a deserted island, and it's just him and his friend, Wilson. Wilson is a soccer ball that Tom Hanks personifies. And he, he makes Wilson out to be a person. And this is who he relates to. And you might say to yourself, what does this have to do with the Holy Spirit? Hang with me for a minute. Some people suggest that sometimes uh, in Scripture, and it is true to a degree, uh, that sometimes in Scripture, things that are not persons are personified. And uh, in the same way that Tom Hanks personified his ball, Wilson. And that's fine. It makes sense. Tom Hanks could personify a ball. So some might say, well, why is it uh, that the Holy Spirit has to be a person in order for us to personify him? Let me, let me backtrack here a little bit. The Holy Spirit is a person, but we have not personified him to make him out to be a person in the same way that Tom Hanks personified his dear ball, Wilson. 
And I'll tell you why. Because of this reason right here. You can treat the Holy Spirit in personal ways. You can treat the Holy Spirit in personal ways. For example, let's go back to Acts chapter 5. What did Ananias and Sapphira do? They lied to the Holy Spirit. Now, you could lie if you wanted to, to a ball. You could lie. But does it really make a difference? No. What's the difference with the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit responded to that lie. Forces don't respond. Forces don't have feelings. Uh, Peter, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we, we see also that here Peter said, listen, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? You don't test something that is not a person. Uh, the Holy Spirit is treated in personified ways. Like it, it, he's a person. Uh, he can be grieved. We'll, we'll see in just a moment. The Holy Spirit also has a mind. Things do not have minds. Forces do not have minds. Persons rather have minds. Isaiah 11.2 says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The Spirit we see has a mind, has knowledge, understands things. Forces don't understand things. Things don't understand things. The Holy Spirit is not in it. The Holy Spirit is a person. And how do we know this? We know this for this reason. The Holy Spirit has and has demonstrated emotions. Ephesians 4.30 talks about the Holy Spirit grieving. Grieving. Did you know that you can grieve the Holy Spirit? Did you know that you can quench the Holy Spirit? That is not something that you can do to a force. You cannot grieve a force, but you can grieve a person. And I'll try to go a little quickly here. The Holy Spirit is described in Scripture as a he, not an it. Holy Spirit is described as a person. Grammatically, it's described as a person, not an it. Uh, John 14, 16 through 17 says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the Word cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and, you will, and will be in you. The Holy Spirit is not in it. It is not a force. It is not an energy. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit can be hurt. It, it has emotions. It has a mind. These are the characteristics of not a force, my friends, but this is the characteristics of a person. The Holy Spirit has personhood. I wish we had time because if we did, I'd take you through all these other things that the Bible says the Holy Spirit does. The Bible talks about the Holy Spirit as a teacher. It teaches, the Holy Spirit teaches, testifies, intercedes, warns, speaks, knows, calls out, hears. These are all things that the Holy Spirit do, uh, does. Does gravity do any of these? Does any force or energy do any of these? No. The Bible talks about the Holy Spirit doing all of these things. The Holy Spirit is a person. Now, this is what I really want you to know, though. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is a person. You can interact with the Holy Spirit. But the beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is our helper. Our helper. Our helper. Remember earlier when I told you about uh, the fact that some Christians do Christianity without the Holy Spirit, without yielding to the Holy Spirit. I think there's one of three reasons. I think, number one, either they have not really been converted, either it has, hasn't been a true salvation experience, 
maybe they grew up in church and they think because they grew up in church, they're automatically Christians. Or maybe because they've always gone to church or, or maybe they just started attending a church or they have membership into a church. They thought that oh, automatically I am saved. But the reality is, the reality is, is that in order for you to have the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of you, you need to have had a true conversion, a true yielding to God, a true conversion. There's other reasons why I believe the Holy Spirit isn't active in some Christians' lives, and we'll talk about that. But I want you to know, first and foremost, the Holy Spirit is your helper. John 14, 15 through 17 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Did you know that the Holy Spirit will be with you forever? That you have a helper that will be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. So this is not for the world. This is for the believers. Only the believers get the seal of the Holy Spirit. Only the believers get the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them. Because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. If you are a believer, you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. That's why the Bible tells us, don't, don't you know that you are God's temple? You literally are the temple where the Holy Spirit resides. You literally are the temple. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of every believer. He is our helper. He's the one that guides us. Romans 8, 26 and 27 takes that further. It says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. In our weakness, the Holy Spirit helps us. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. That's so beautiful because I don't know if you've ever been in that place where you're just crying out to God and you don't even know what to say. You just don't even know what to say. Like you're in a situation and you're like, look, I know Spanish, I know English, I speak in tongues, and I still don't know what to say. I still don't get it. I still don't know what to say. The Bible says it's in those moments that the Holy Spirit, your helper, our helper, is there interceding for us. That, that, is, that is so beautiful and that's so powerful to know that you have a helper that's, that's on your side. That, yeah, you're, you're in the fight, but your helper is right there saying, you got this. I'm praying for you. I'm interceding. You got this. You can keep going. Keep pushing through. It's, it's going to be okay. You get to win this battle. I know it doesn't look like it right now, but you do win. You do win. And the Holy Spirit is, is pushing you, interceding for you. Keep, keep going. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We talked a, uh, a little while ago about, you know, aligning our lives to the will of God. You want to align yourself to what God's heart is for you, because as long as you continue to fight it, uh, what God wants for you is different than what you want for you, you're never going to succeed. It's better for you to say, Lord, I'm going to abandon what I want for me, and I'm going to go after what you want for me. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is praying the will of God happens in your life. That's what the Holy Spirit is all about. But here's my question. Are you doing, by the way, this is the sermon right here, okay? We made it. We made it. Short sermon now, okay? Short sermon. Are you doing Christianity without the Holy Spirit? I believe there's three reasons why some of us might be. Are you doing Christianity without the Holy Spirit? I believe there's three reasons why we might be. The first reason is that maybe we never had a true conversion. And if that's the case, 
then let's make sure that we have a true yielding to God. That we really repent for our sins. That we really give up everything that this world has for everything that God has for our lives. So number one, there needs to be genuine repentance, a genuine faith placed in Jesus Christ. Then the Holy Spirit will come in and reside on the inside of you. So I believe that's one reason. But I believe that there's two reasons that the Bible also talks to us about. I think a second reason is perhaps the Holy Spirit is not as active in your life because maybe you have grieved the Holy Spirit in your life. Maybe you've gotten to the place where you have grieved the Holy Spirit. So now you've gotten to the place where you're doing Christianity without the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit has been grieved. Or maybe, and this one's really scary, the Holy Spirit has just been quenched in your life. Quenched. You just decided to let the fire die out, that, that it's okay, and it's been quenched. Um, maybe you took on a pattern of sin, and you decided, I'm going to pursue this sin and continue in this sin, and I'm going to quiet the voice of the Holy Spirit in my life, and, and maybe that's why now your, your Christianity, your faith is so dry, and, and you feel like, well, I feel like I've been doing Christianity without the Holy Spirit. I feel like I've been pushing through this on my own. Maybe that's the reason why, because you have not allowed the Holy Spirit to have an active force in your life. You have not allowed the Holy Spirit to work in you. You might ask, well, first of all, my, you might say my, my conversion was true. It was genuine, Pastor Rob. There was a season in my life where I, I felt like I was going on all cylinders. Like I felt like I was pushing for the Lord. It's just more recent that I feel like it's not all there. And I would say maybe that's because you've grieved the Holy Spirit. You say, well, how do I grieve the Holy Spirit? Like, uh, how, how do I grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, I'm going to tell you how you grieve the Holy Spirit, and then we'll talk through a passage together. You, you grieve the Holy Spirit, number one, by walking in darkness. You grieve the Holy Spirit by failing to put off your old self. You grieve the Holy Spirit by failing to renew your mind according to the Spirit. You grieve the Holy Spirit by holding on to things that are false. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we give Satan a foothold, an opportunity in our lives. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we continue to live out in sinful patterns. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we continue to live in bitterness. And we don't have the forgiving hearts that we should have. All of these things, once we start developing those patterns, what ultimately happens is that we grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4. Let's read this passage together. Because I want to show you how you might have grieved the Holy Spirit. How you might still be grieving the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason I'm sharing this is not to make you feel bad. The reason I'm sharing this is because I believe that you need the Holy Spirit in your life as a believer. I believe that you need the Holy... I, I, I can't stress that enough. Uh, it, it's, it's, we, it's time we stop being a dry Christian. It's, stop, it's time we stop the dry Christianity and we get back to allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. It's time we yield it to the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 17 to, through 32, it goes by quick, don't worry. Now, this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. In the futility sorry, of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Here, we're talking about someone that has hardened their own heart to the things of God. They've allowed a, a, a spirit of, of just sin and sinfulness to permeate their minds and thoughts, and they have alienated themselves from the things of God. Now, maybe, maybe they still go to church every Sunday. And maybe, maybe they still go to Bible study. But, but in their heart, they have alienated themselves. Why? Because they've allowed sinful patterns to now come in and permeate them. 
They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth in Jesus. To put off your old self. To put off your old self. Do you realize that it takes intention to put off your old self? It takes intention for you to say, I'm not going to be the old me. I'm not going to be the the person that used to fight so quickly. I'm not going to be the person that used to lie. I'm not going to be the person that used to fall into every sort of sinful pattern just to protect him or herself. I'm not going to be that person. I need to put off my old self. There are things that God will do for you. But there are other things that God lets you do for yourself. Like putting off your old self, that's something that you would do. Which belongs to what? Your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And to put on, so this is what you do do, you take off your old self, but you put on your new self. You say, well, I'm going to take off that coat, I'm going to take off that jacket, but here's a new jacket for me. Here's a new self that God has for me. This is, this is the one that's a peacemaker. This is the one that doesn't lie to people. This is the one that does, that does the right thing just because he loves God, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because of my love for God, I do the right thing. This is my, this is my new self. I put on my new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And then he goes on. He says, therefore, having put away falsehood, let Each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief... Uh, let, let the thief steal, no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And this is where he lands, finally. He says, and do not grieve. Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed. You see how all those things, you see how us leaving the old self on, not putting on the new self, us acting in ways that are ungodly, do you see how those things grieve the Holy Spirit? And some of us, I'll let you read the passage, the rest of the passage on your own, but some of us have grieved the Holy Spirit simply because we've taken on these sinful patterns and we've allowed ourselves to go far and far away from God. It's not God that has moved, but it is we ourselves that have allowed sin to, uh, become, to become a chasm between us and God. And maybe we're still Christians, maybe we're still believers, maybe the, and maybe this Holy Spirit still resides on the inside of us. I'm not uh, taking any of that away, but I wonder if some of us have grieved the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I don't think I grieved the Holy Spirit, but, and, and you might be right, but have you quenched the Holy Spirit? I want to get straight to the text, because there are several ways in which we can grieve the Holy Spirit. I mean, quench uh, the spirit in our lives. This is what First Thessalonians, I hope you're writing these down because these are, I, I, I would hope you go back and read these. Uh, they're really good. Chapter 5, verse 12 through 22. It says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in the love Uh, in love because of their work. Be at peace amongst yourselves, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. One of the ways that you quench the Holy Spirit, and one of the ways we, I have to put myself here as well, one of the ways that we allow ourselves to quench the spirit of our lives, sometimes honestly, is by not honoring and respecting the leadership that God has placed over us. 
and, and this is not self-serving, you'll see where we're going with this. This is what the Bible is talking about. In context, we want to see how is it that you quench the Holy Spirit? Well, when we don't esteem each other, when we don't love our brother as we love ourselves. Um, and then, I love this, by the way, admonish the idol. Admonish the idol. What is it saying there? Uh, I love the fact that it says admonish the idol, and then it says encourage the faint-hearted. There are some in our midst that are idle Christians. Idle. What, what do I mean by idle? They're, they're in neutral. They'll go where the wind blows. They're neither here nor there. There's just a whole lot of apathy. It's okay if I'm involved in the church. It's okay if I'm not. It's okay if I'm doing something in ministry. It's okay if I'm not. It's okay if I attend. It's okay if I don't. What, what, is, what does he say here? He says, admonish the idol. You would think he would say, be a little more positive and say, encourage the idol. No. He says, warn them. Warn them that if you don't get this together, if you don't get this right, and you continue to quench the spirit in your life, uh, warn them. There's going to be a dryness about you. There's going to be a lack of spiritual fervor in your life. So he says, admonish the idol. He says, but encourage the faint-hearted. And those are two different people. Encourage the faint-hearted. Someone that is pushing through, but they're losing courage because of something that may be going on. That person you encourage. The person that they're still pushing through. Uh, not the person that is idle. The person that's idle, you warn. The person that's still pushing through, even though it looks like they can't push through anymore. That person you encourage. And you say, you keep going. And he says, help the weak. But this is important for all of us. All right? But be patient with all of them. Be patient. Warn the idle. Encourage the faint-hearted. But be patient. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the part that I don't like. Because <laughs> I want the idle to, you know, chop, chop onion. Come on, let's get going. And, and I want the faint-hearted. Okay, stop crying. Stop pity party. Come on. Stop, you know, I don't want to hear it. And, and most of us fall into that category where we, we are just, we, we, we lose patience. He's saying, look, be patient. Warn them. Don't be mean and, and don't be nasty, but do warn them. And to the faint-hearted, encourage them and, and, and continue to encourage them. But I'll keep going. He says, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. So it's this, how do we quench the spirit? We quench the spirit when we're not loving each other right. Do you see that? We quench the spirit when, when we're not acting like we should be acting. When, when we're Christians by name only, uh, that's, when, that's when we start quenching the spirit. God wants you to be nice to people. Look at that revelation. I mean, that was worth the price of admission right there. God wants us to be nice. Amen. Let's praise God. Let's pray and the service right there. That's maybe all you needed. Be nice to somebody. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Be grateful for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And then he says, do not, do not quench the spirit. And this is how you quench the spirit. You quench the spirit when, when, when you're, you're just not there for people. That, that, just, that just messes ministry up. By the way, did you know that ministry simply means to serve other people? Did you know that? It simply means to serve other people. What I'm doing right here is that my, what I'm trying to do right here is that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to serve you with the word of God. That's, that's my duty. That's what ministry does. This is about serving you. I'm giving you the word of God. I am serving it to you. That's what ministry does. He says, so go ahead, do that. Be, be, be the person I want you to be and don't quench the spirit. He says, do not despise prophecies. Test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Some of us have gotten to the place where we've either grieved the Holy Spirit in our lives or we've quenched the Holy Spirit. 
and we're left wondering, why is my Christian walk so dry? Why does it just feel like I'm just going through the motions? Why is there no flavor to it? Why, why is there no, n- nothing that's exciting uh, about it? And, and I would say uh, perhaps you have quenched the Spirit. Perhaps you have grieved the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to give you one bonus reason or one bonus way in which we can sometimes quench the Holy Spirit. This is a bonus right here. Paul wrote to Timothy, and he says this, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. Fan into flame. What is he talking about? Obviously not quenching it. Not, uh, and quenching, in case you don't know, quenching just simply means to, to just stop, to, to, to take the fire out. Right, You quench the Spirit. You take the fire out. You take the fire of the Holy Spirit out in your life. Um, Paul tells Timothy, he says, I want you to fan the flame. What is he telling him? I want you to make sure that the fire keeps burning. Make sure the fire keeps burning. Timothy, don't let the fire die out. And this is what I want to tell you, church. This is what I want to tell you, New Walk. Don't let the fire of the Holy Spirit die out in you. But rather, fan the flame of it. And you're saying, like, whoa, 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 okay, fan the flame, but I don't see the fire. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, let, let, me, let me be more specific. Which is in you through the lane on of my hands. For God gave us the spirit of fear, uh, did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. What are we talking about here? Let me bring it from the abstract to the very real. God has given each and every one of us gifts. And this is a completely different sermon. I'm not preaching this one next week, but this is a completely different sermon on just gifts that God has given each and every one of us. You have a gift. I have a gift. Your gift may be different than my gift. My gift may be different than your gift. We all have gifts. And the purpose that we have gifts is so that we can continue to serve one another with the gifts that God has given us. The gift that I have is for your service. And the gift that you have is for my service. Like, like you should be serving me with your gifts, um, Cubanitos, for example, and... I serve you with my gifts. How do some of us quench the spirit? I'm going to tell you how. By neglecting the gifts that God has given us. By not doing anything with the gifts that God has given us. Some of us have gifts of administration, and we're sitting on them. Some of us, God has given us gifts of encouragement, and we're sitting on them. I know how to be encouraging to people. I just don't want to do it. (laughs) Some of us, God has given us gifts. The reason he's given you a gift is so that you operate in that gift. And when you don't operate in that gift, what happens? You Quench the spirit. You don't fan the flame. Some of, uh, some of you know me, and you know me well, and you know that, you know, by the grace of God, I have some talents, and, and, and maybe you say, wow, man, this guy, not only does he do that, he does this, that, 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 and he does all these things. Jack of all trades, master of none, right? He, he does all those things. And I'm going to tell you how I ended up doing all those things. I'm going to tell you my secret. And it's not that one day I woke up and wanted to do all those things. My secret is that there was always stuff missing at our church. There was always somebody missing to do something. So here, Rob, I just, I'm in love with Jesus, and I've got the Holy Spirit working in my life. And I said, well, you know what? We need somebody to do that, and that's not getting done. Let me learn how to do it. And I started learning how to do that thing. And then, and then I said, oh, wait, we're missing something over here. And I learned how to do that. And, and oh, we're missing this over here. I learned how to do that. I fanned into flames 
the gifts that God had given me. To the point where now there's fires everywhere. And, and I can do a bunch of things. But, but here's the reality. I shouldn't have to do a bunch of things. Because there should be people within the body of Christ that already do things. That, that we don't have areas that are missing. But people are doing, and they're fanning the flame. What has God given you to do? Are you quenching the spirit, and are, are you operating in the gifts that God wants you to operate, or are you simply sitting on it? 2020, I had an opportunity to sit on my gifts for a little bit. I'm not going to lie to you. It was nice. It was nice to go to church Somebody else had to worry about preaching. Somebody else had to worry about whether people were coming or not. Somebody else had to worry about these things. And all I had to do was come in with my family, uh, laugh a little, cry a little, and then go back home. It was beautiful. I envy some of you guys. But God finally came back and said, oh, vacation is over. And here I am. And, and I, I want you to know I want you to know that God wants you to fan into flames what he's given you. And you might say, well, it's small. You know, I don't really do much. It's just this is what I do. You know, back in the day, uh, all, somebody might say, all I do is drive the church bus. That's all I do. Man, if you would take some ministry like that and just say, wait, I'm going to fan this into flames. I knew a man in our church, at our old church, where he was the church bus driver. And most church bus drivers hate the church bus driving job. I'm just going to say that's what I've realized, or at least that's what happened in my church. They hate it. They get to people's houses. People say, oh, I'm not coming today, and, and they hated that. So it was, it was annoying. But we had this one church bus driver that decided to fan into flames what God had given him to do. You know what this guy would do? He would take the church buses. He would clean them out to the T. You've never sat in a cleaner church bus than the church buses he had. I mean, these things were shiny, shiny tires, everything. People wanted to come to church just for the ride in the bus, okay? I mean, this man fanned into flame what God had given him. And you know what? This man today pastors a church in Florida. Bus driver. Somebody that just started something simple. I know another man who fanned into flames the gifts that God had given him. This man, he started with a little food pantry. And, and by saying little food pantry, I mean a closet, okay? It was a dark little closet, barely had a light bulb in it. And he was able to get some food in there, squeeze in stuff there. When we first got married, it was a blessing because he'd come and give me stuff. He's like, hey, Rob, come over here and just fill me up with food and, and give me stuff. He started with a little closet. Today, that same food pantry is the largest food pantry in New York City. He fanned into flame the little thing that God had given him. But what are we doing? Are we sitting on it? And are we quenching the spirit? And our lives, our lives are so dry, I feel like there's no purpose to my life. Well, have you quenched the work of the spirit in your life? Or are you ready to fan into flame what God has already given you? Here's the good news. The Holy Spirit is your helper. And it's not just your helper so that you can walk the Christian life. Sure, that, that needs some help. We need the Holy Spirit there. But we need the Holy Spirit so that he begins to mold us into the person of Jesus Christ. I know plenty of Christians that are doing Christianity without the Holy Spirit. And to be honest with you, it's pathetic Christianity. It's powerless. Um, it's hopeless. It, it seems like it's just there. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is your helper. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. It's time that we don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It's time that we don't quench the Spirit in our lives, but rather that we fan into flames what God has been wanting to do in and through our lives. Can God do it? Can God do it with you? You better believe he can do it with you. I've seen him do it with people that had less than you. God can do it in you. God can do amazing things. What if, 
What if you yield it to the Holy Spirit? What if from today forward you said, no, I'm going to yield. I'm going to rely more on the Holy Spirit. I'm going to fan into flames the gifts that God has given me. I'm going to do something. What if? What if you did that? How, how, would, how would your life look different? How would things change for you? And, and, and what if you did it? And what if we did it? And, and what if all of a sudden it wasn't just you? You know, isn't it true that somebody that's on fire for God seems to, it seems to have a, a contagious effect upon other people? Have you ever noticed that? That somebody that's on fire, fired up for the Lord, all of a sudden, they start here all of a sudden, but all of a sudden, somebody else picks that up and other people pick it up. What would happen if you did it individually? What would happen if you contaminated this uh, Holy Spirit virus here in this church? What would happen if we were all functioning that way? What would happen if our church was fired up like that? What would happen? to other churches if that happened if we again allowed the holy spirit to have his full effect in our lives what would happen i want you to know i believe south plainfield would change i believe middlesex county would change i believe the state of new jersey would change I believe that, that we could make an impact. I believe that if we really took this message seriously, if we really said, you know what, today I will make sure, I will make sure that I fan into flames all that God has given me. I guarantee you there would be a difference. There would be a difference. So what are you waiting for? What, what are you waiting for? What do you still need? I want you to know the Holy Spirit is waiting on you. He's waiting on you. He's saying, I don't want to be grieved. I want you to, to love people. I want you to love people well. I, I want you to seek my face. Don't give yourself into sin. You know, we, we know where sin is going to leave us. We know that it's going to leave us empty. So why not seek God? Why not go after the things that God wants for us? And why not allow the Holy Spirit to again reignite whatever was lost and say, Lord, I want you to do something fresh in my life. I want you to do something new. Amen? Let us pray.